Hey everyone, welcome to Pursuit of Infinity. I'm Josh, your host, and uh, you will have heard an intro to today's guest if you're listening to the audio only version. But if you're watching the video, welcome. Today we're here with Caleb Graves. Thank you so much, man, for joining me. Definitely, really happy to be here. So you just graduated from Duke Divinity School. Uh, what were you studying, and uh, how how did that all go? Yeah, so uh, I just finished up a three-year degree called a Master's of Divinity at Duke Divinity School. Um, it was uh, tough. Started during COVID. Uh, my first year was 2020, uh, but it was it was uh, at first just a year of trying to figure out what sort of field I should get into, uh, what uh, brought all of my interests together. Uh, but after I tried magic mushrooms for the first time in 2021, uh, I realized that I wanted to study this uh, professionally and theologically. Uh, so I took a lot of classes with uh, uh, psychology, uh, took a couple of directed studies in about uh, psychedelics and dreams and visions in the Christian uh, Bible, but also in early Christian history. Uh, and focused a lot of my other work on psychedelics so that even if the class wasn't about it, uh, the professors knew me well enough that they'd let me write about pretty much anything and everything as long as it was tangentially related to the topic at hand. Perfect. So were you theologically inclined or religious before 2021 when you took mushrooms for the first time, or were the mushrooms the catalyst for your uh, spiritual journey? No, I was pretty spiritual um, long before uh, taking magic mushrooms. Um, you know, I've thought about, I've gone to the doctor for it, actually tried to get some tests done about it. I've had really, really strong spiritual experiences that might even resemble seizures uh, since I was seven, eight, nine years old, uh, where I just sort of disassociate for a while, forget the worlds around me, lose track of time for a bit. Um, and uh, I had much more of a spiritual life leading into uh, seminary when um, I had to work a minimum wage job, couldn't really make end meet. Uh, for two years, I lived below the poverty line. Uh, and um, I had to have some sort of support to survive. Um, so I created a really rich spiritual life for myself, daily prayer, daily self-care, all of those things uh, to really just keep me going at a job I hated, constantly chronically sick, couldn't afford a doctor, et cetera. Um, and honestly, with Magic Mushrooms, uh, that first big trip wasn't spiritual for me. It was powerful, absolutely incredible, but it wasn't really a spiritual experience. Um, but nonetheless, when you have a powerful experience, you want to figure out what just happened to you. Um, and as, as I started exploring LSD in particularly, that was more of a spiritual experience for me and made me realize that, oh, there could be some more overlap between my theological Christian studies and these substances more than I thought there was. So what was happening with these, like, were they spontaneous experiences that you were describing as seizure-like? What was the experience like, and what was actually happening to you? Uh, it's not like I, I saw anything or anything like that. It was just this really, really deep sense of closeness to God, uh, like my myself or my, you know, here in psychedelics a lot, my ego sort of faded away. And I remember one particular time outside of my church, just looking up into the night sky. And it was like for a few minutes, there was no difference between me and the night sky. There was just an utter connection between us. Um, and you know, I've, I've struggled with my, my mental health for years, had two suicide attempts as a young child, as a young child, as a teenager. Uh, but um, it, so it's it's been back and forth between pretty significant uh, uh, struggle with anxiety and depression, but also I think connected to those things, also these very strong, peaceful religious experiences as well. And did you find that these experiences helped you to contextualize the suicidal ideation and suicide attempts? Not really. Um, I grew up in a very fundamentalist, very abusive church environment, uh, which strongly contributed to my suicide attempts. Um, so instead of really having any sort of context to help me understand what was going on, 
I thought this was just the sort of spiritual experience that growing up in a Baptist church, everybody talks about feeling God in your heart, Jesus in your heart, feeling the movement of the spirit, that sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until my 20s when I started to realize that um, these experiences were more than what most people had. Uh, and it, I had them even when I didn't really intellectually believe in God, but I'd still have these very peaceful spiritual experiences. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's it, really what got me into using substances at all. I remember smoking weed in college. Uh, we, I went to school in Colorado. That was pretty freely available. Um, but one of the first things I did was uh, when I started smoking a lot was smoke a ton of weed and read the Gnostic scriptures in the Nag Hammadi Codex uh, just to see if anything was there. Uh, so there's always been a seeker aspect in it for me. Um, but I, again, with my first trip with shrooms, didn't think of it as spiritual. It took a number of different um, experiences before I started to realize, oh, there's some overlap between the spiritual experiences I have more um, spontaneously, I guess, and these that can be induced by substances. Can you talk a little bit about the details of the overlap? Yeah, um, there's definitely a great sense of that sense of oneness or unity um, or uh, just lack of boundary between oneself and whatever else is out there. Um, I've described it before, like almost like the world in front of you is a veil and you can just pinch it and pull it apart and there's something right behind there. Um, and that's that exact same sense of, of expectation, um, that there is something there that is, it's coming, it's, it's at the door, um, has happened these spontaneous experiences, uh, but has also happened during psychedelic experiences as well. Yeah, that interconnectedness is such a common theme. And not only is it common, but it is paradigm shifting, life changing oftentimes, because in this culture, in this society, whether you're a religious person or an atheist, you're still sort of taught that you're separate from God, you're separate from the universe, you're separate from this and that, and you need an authority figure to like solidify your connection, whether it be a scientist or a preacher or you know whatever it, it may be. Um, but I had a question that I was, I was contemplating earlier today, actually, sure. and is, is, are psychedelics in the Bible? This is a question that I get a lot. Um, I have seen no good evidence of that. Um, I think the first thing that we can, should do when we're looking at the scriptures, like I don't think a lot of what we see in the scriptures is historical. So there was no historical Moses or Abraham or Adam or stuff like that. A lot of the stories of Jesus were theological retellings about who early Christians believed Jesus should be. So I think it's always best to start with the historical, archaeological, what, what can we know before we start hypothesizing about other things? And while I've heard theories about it being in, uh, you know, psychedelics being used by Moses and uh, having interactions like the burning bush um, or manna uh, wandering in, uh, in the wilderness after the exodus, um, or even the showbread in, uh, with David in first or second Samuel, don't remember right now. Um, but I've never seen good evidence of this. Um, I will say there is a, I believe it's eighth or ninth century, uh, altar in Judah, uh, BCE. Um, that's the Telerod, uh, uh, altar. And on this particular altar that was being used by, you know, the predecessors to the Jewish people during this timeline, uh, there was cannabis being used. Uh, so while not necessarily a psychedelic, it's clear that there was some substance use involved in early Israelite religion. Um, but I really think what this question often brings up is that when you have these powerful experiences and you have that sense of interconnectedness, 
you want to find as many connections as possible. <laughs> so, you know, I've heard uh, people say that the lotus flower in Buddhism, that must be a psychedelic. Uh, or that uh, uh, looking at Judaism and uh, similar overlap with the Bible, uh, that some of the substances they use must have been psychedelics. Um, but I don't see any historical evidence of that. It would make my life a lot easier. It'd make my job a lot easier if there was some, but I just, I, I haven't seen enough evidence to convince me of that. So I have a friend who is um, a fun fundamental Christian through and through, and we always have like philosophical, spiritual conversations because, you know, in his mind, we are opposed because he's Christian and I am whatever I am, you know, with yeah. psychedelics. Um, and he often would tell me that, in the Bible, it is said that psychedelics, other drugs of this nature, are put here by the devil to test us. Like they're um, they're demonic in nature, and mm. the reason that we think that they're spiritually enlightening is just because that's sort of built into the facade that they are in order to trick us into taking the devil's path. Is that just like a misconception? Like where does that notion come from? Yeah. Um... It's really interesting. This seems like it's off topic for a second, but when you look at the uh, UN's condemnation of drugs, it uses the word evil. That's a very moral and very religious sort of language. It's not just harmful to society. It's not just dangerous. It's evil, moral condemnation. Um I think we see a long-standing taboo between substance use and Christianity. Um, things that are foreign or outside of everyone's daily conception of what religion is, is always scary. Um, coffee, chocolate, these things used to be uh, questionable to the Christian mind because they were associated with uh, uh, Mesoamerican and Latin American religion and associated with Islam. Um, so there was some back and forth about how these substances should be accepted. When you look at psychedelics, which aren't just associated with other religions, but can also induce very powerful experiences, early missionaries after uh colonialism began in uh, Latin America, most of them condemned it as witchcraft or something similar. Uh, most of them condemned it as a fake uh, way of trying to approach God. But it, there were interesting two minorities of groups as well. One group said uh, that um, psychedelics were preparing indigenous people for the Eucharist, for the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine that Christians have at Mass or in some other services. Um, so in that way, God had specially given these medicines to indigenous people as a special sort of alternative Eucharist. The other side of that were people who believed that these substances, especially peyote and uh, uh, magic mushrooms, were the anti-Eucharist. So if the, the wafer and the uh, juice or wine turns into the body of Christ, then the magic mushroom turns into the real body of Satan. So there was a strong, strong condemnation of these substances that they weren't just foreign or bad because they weren't Christian. They were almost like an anti-Christian substance. And even though uh, um, belief even belief in the existence of magic mushrooms and peyote sort of faded away among some people, um, that this was sort of a mythological idea that the uh, indigenous people had made up. When psychedelic use came back, a lot of those old hatreds and those old taboos were still somewhere present in our belief system. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think that that's true, that it's the body and blood of Satan or that it's put out to deceive us or tempt us. Um, you know, some of the missionaries believed that peyote was still a medicine and that even if, you know, maybe it wasn't always the best thing to do, God had entrusted it to indigenous people. And like I said before, some people saw it as a positive thing that God had given to indigenous people so that they could be either prepared for the arrival of the Christian Eucharist or that there was a special gift given to these people that were not given to white people. Um, so in that way, I, I, don't, I just don't buy that this is an inherently bad thing or a tempting thing. 
um, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, says that we should uh, test the fruits of every tree to see if what is there is good and pure and true. And I think when we look at the fruits of psychedelics, when taken in a good set and setting, good dosage, good education, good testing, all of these things, the fruits are therapeutic, the fruits are helpful, the fruits are good. Um, so that's strong reason why I accept psychedelics. And, uh, and it's, it's no different than the argument that, you know, Satan put dinosaur bones in the earth to test us, that evolution is not true. Uh, but of course, I accept evolution is a historical fact. And I also accept that psychedelics can be a path for real healing. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Um, you bring up the Eucharist, which I think is a very interesting concept. Um, have you read the book or heard of uh, The Immortality Key by Brian Murarescu? I have, yes. So what do you think about the Eleusinian mysteries and their supposed um, like being the foundation of the Christian religion and how the Eucharist itself sort of came to be? So I don't buy it. <laughs> I'll just say that. I'll say that outright. I don't buy it. Um, we see uh, early on with uh, Wasson, who was a psychedelic investigator, brought magic mushrooms to the forefront of American consciousness with a Life magazine article. Um, and then Houston Smith as well wrote some things about this, a uh, comparative religion scholar. Um, a lot of the arguments that are made for connecting these ancient Greco-Roman or uh, uh, Near Eastern mystery religions to Christianity um, really fail in a lot of aspects. And it's not just this book. You see similar theories in a bunch of other publications as well. Um, for instance, the, the, the Mithras cult uh, uh, and the substance use that seems to have gone on there. We know virtually nothing about it. Uh, we have very little written about it. We have a few broken lines from uh, uh, manuscripts that we have from Egypt. We have a lot of carvings that we know are of this cult, but we don't really know what they mean. We're just sort of throwing our best interpretations out there. Um, and while I think there's clearly a long history of substance use within Greco-Roman religion, within Egyptian religion, Near Eastern religion, like the Telerod uh, uh, altar that I was just telling you about, just because there are some aesthetic similarities between things doesn't mean there's a direct connection. Um, so I'm much more strongly of the opinion, you no know, bread and wine, just that's just what you eat. Uh, if you look at what the historical Jesus did, he had a meal of bread and wine. And if you look at the simplest answer for things, he had a meal of bread and wine, and then he died. The man was probably sharp enough to know he wasn't making it out of this weekend. So, you know, the, he's telling them, remember us, remember this meal, remember what's about to happen. And they did. They ate the bread, they drank the wine. Um, a lot of the theology that... Uh, of mysticism, the connection between Jesus and the bread and the wine, comes from slightly later tradition in the Gospel of John, uh, 90 to 110 CE, and then beyond that in the second century. So I think that there could be some overlap between some people converting into Christianity out of these mystery religions. But the fact that there is some parallel or people who might have brought aspects of their faith with them when converting into Christianity doesn't mean that there's an origination between these two separate rituals. And it also doesn't mean uh, that the theology is in anywhere, any way comparable either. The historical origins of the Christian Eucharist is just some dudes having bread and wine uh, in the upper room before an execution. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, another interesting um, historical hypothesis I wanted to run by you was uh, Terence and Dennis McKenna's stoned ape theory. Have you heard about this? I have, definitely, yeah. Because you mentioned evolution before. Do you kind of buy into that? I know it's not really too much related to religion itself, but do you buy into like evolution sort of being in part fueled by the consumption of psilocybin mushrooms over millions of years? I don't know. Um I know one of the things people don't know about Terence McKenna a lot of the times is how much this theory is connected to far more, um, um, frankly, a little closer to psychosis sort of thinking. Um, 
his beliefs that magic mushrooms were an alien species who have come down to Earth to coexist and bring the human race into this eventual omega point where we all have knowledge of the truth and everything's great again. Um, so in the context of that broader uh, theory, I don't think his representation of how psychedelic drug use has worked in human evolution makes much sense at all. Um, however, I do think it's possible that psychoactive drug use in general, we know that animals animals use psychoactive drugs, whether it is uh, uh, picking uh, poppy or uh, uh, going and eating fermented fruit, all sorts of things. Animals engage in psychoactive drug consuming behavior. So I don't think it's impossible or even unlikely that if we did see psilocybin mushrooms existing in the same areas, Homo erectus or early uh, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, whatever, and they're consuming these substances, I don't think it's unlikely to think that that could have helped be a catalyst for human evolution with cognition and consciousness. I'm not an evolutionary anthropologist, so I can't say for sure, but I, I like, I, I think the idea is plausible at least. Yeah. It's a cool theory. And, uh, it feels cool when like you're taking psychedelics and you have the experience of like feeling as if your consciousness is evolving on its own itself. And you think, oh, well, if, you know, humans were taking this back in history, then maybe, you know, it helped us to evolve and, you know, the whole doubling of the human brain size thing. But I think a lot of it was based in his or related to Terence McKenna's theory, his time wave theory, which mm -hmm. was like a theory of time, which kind of didn't span out to be anything plausible. So, yeah, I do understand uh, the doubt in that for sure. Yeah. Uh, but. Going back to the relationship between psychedelics and religion, let's talk about their opposition. Why are they so opposed within both ideologies? So uh, you, we just mentioned Terence, Terence McKenna, so let's start there. Um, Terence McKenna had a real apocalyptic view of the world, um, that there is a time in the near future, 2008, 2012, you know, somewhere in that area, where something was going to happen. Human consciousness would have its final eruption and uh, the next stage of evolution would happen. Um, McKenna's view of this was deeply attached to his mistrust of institutions, which rightfully had a mistrust of institutions. His life was filled with institutions failing him. Um, but I think in the 90s and the 80s, that really put a uh, concept into people's minds that Terence McKenna s strongly supported the idea that organized religion was opposed to psychedelic drug use. And it created this animosity between uh, psychedelic subculture, which they might not, not have even known where it came from, but this animosity between organized religion and psychedelic drug subculture. And it's something that still exists to this day. Um, on religion side of things, um, organized religion, it's really interesting. Um, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s with the psychedelic revolution that happened there, most of the people engaged in the study were deeply Christian. Um, so we have a uh, uh, magic mushroom species that, like I said, uh, Wasson, when he brought magic mushrooms to light in America with the Time Magazine article, one of the mushrooms he came across ended up being named after a Christian missionary because this missionary had found, you know, found and categorized that mushroom. Uh, Albert Hoffman, who discovered LSD, was himself a devoted Christian. Uh, Houston Smith, who I previously mentioned, was a Methodist minister. Uh, uh, the Good Friday experiment in 1962 at Marsh Chapel at Boston University, uh, where the esteemed Howard Thurman, civil rights leader and advocate, was preaching that day. Um, psychedelics and Christianity and religion as a whole, Judaism, Islam, etc., um, had a pretty good relationship. Unfortunately, um, and I think this is part of where McKenna really uh, actually hit home on something. We do see the rise of white Christian nationalism in the 80s, especially with Ronald Reagan and 
the war on drugs goes into full effect. So at that point, the, the language was, if you are a good Christian, you don't just not use substances. You don't just not, just like you wouldn't just not drink, you have to engage in prohibition. You have to be a teetotaler for everyone. It's not enough that you don't take LSD or magic mushrooms. No one can. And you, to be a good Christian, you have to believe that and act on that. Um, so I think that that political struggle really put people in a tough place where a lot of Christians in the 60s and 70s who loved psychedelics, who engaged in psychedelics, um, were put in a place where not only did they have to choose between their faith and psychedelics, they had to choose between their faith and jail. <laughs> and that's not a great option. Um, and so the voices that we heard about organized religion and psychedelics were reduced to Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, uh, and the presidents that came after that. Um, and so it's no surprise that psychedelic subculture in the 90s and early 2000s and late 80s too, with DMT being more popular, um, shifted towards the only Christian voices they're hearing are negative and oppressive. So of course they're going to believe that Christianity and religion as a whole must only be negative and oppressing towards them. It it, it makes sense. And I've heard you say that um, psychedelics can help to deconstruct white Christian nationalism. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, um, it, it's it's a fine line here. Um, We've seen recently uh, a number of examples of white supremacists, not even white Christian nationalism, alt-right, full far-right fascist, using psychedelic drugs in large quantities. Um, you go all the way, I mean, you go all the way back to the Manson family and their neo-Nazi beliefs, and LSD was very prominent, very, very easy to condemn them. But especially since the Charlottesville riots, there have been numerous examples of neo-Nazis, white supremacists, KKK members, whatever, using psychedelic drugs to support their beliefs. I go on Stormfront, the white supremacist website, which probably has me on a list for that now. Um, but I go and will just every, every once in a while just control find in their website, LSD, DMT, magic mushrooms, psychedelics. And these white supremacists, violent white supremacists, are using a lot of drugs, a lot of psychedelics in particular. So all that to say, I urge caution with trying to look at psychedelics as this way that can just easily deconstruct. If you take LSD or magic mushrooms or DMT, it's going to be peace, love, and understanding from now on. Um, but I do think um, that it has the potential to break up a lot of the trauma and break up a lot of the negative aspects of one's worldview if they have cognitive dissonance that can help them be more open to better beliefs about the world. Um, but the thing is, the psychedelic experience is not just something that happens in the head. When we look at how it, psychedelics create healing, you have the pharmacological effect with anti-inflammation and things of that nature, neurological, psychological, and then at the top, social. It is incredibly important that um, psychedelic subculture, and this is why I think churches as a whole should be involved, should be there to help people integrate their experiences. If the experience that one is integrating, if the context in which one is integrating the experience is a far right context, they're going to become more far right. But if it's your, you know, kind of annoying uncle who voted for Trump in 2020, uh, and he is doing it in the context of a bunch of buddies who might not be like that, it might be a chance for him to have a little bit of self reflection. Um, so it, it's a mixed bag. I don't think it is an inherent thing that psychedelics can do. In fact, psychedelics can do the opposite, ironically. But there is the potential to help break up the traumas and break up the negative, um, paradoxical, contradictory beliefs that people have that help make up white supremacy. This reminds me of like the Aztecs. You know, the Aztecs used to take psychedelic mushrooms and then sacrifice people. 
um, the Vikings used to take psychedelic mushrooms and then go to war. So mm-hmm. this really brings back the idea of set and setting, set being so important, like what you're bringing to it, what your intentions are, because they are, as Stan Groff would describe them, nonspecific amplifiers of um, like psychic processes. Mm-hmm. And if your psychic processes are that of a far right fascist, then there's a potential for that to just be bubbled up right to the surface and be reinforced. Yeah, and that's something that um that's something that I've really tried to bring up with people a lot. Um is the when when we look at the Good Friday experiment where where a ton of Christian seminarians and professors were given psychedelics, they unsurprisingly had very Christian psychedelic experiences. Um and I think there's also this idea with people who take psychedelics um, in a more new age setting that it is inherent that the beliefs that somebody has must be um, must must arrive at the new age approach by taking psychedelics. But the fact of the matter is, because so many psychedelics has been adopted so well by new age beliefs. That's the, that is the context and, and that is the set setting and content that one is taking these drugs with. So they're more likely to interpret it in this way. Um, it's interesting um, when you look at uh, DNA, what we might call Navajo peyote use, um, that the Navajo or DNA um, tribal elders, when peyote use became more popular, um, condemned it. They condemned the use of peyote. This wasn't just something being done by white Christians, but also DNA people as well, because they said this is a foreign, uh, this is a foreign tradition to us. This is not something that we do. And it took a long time of indigenous people trying to show that peyote could actually um, help preserve their culture, help preserve their beliefs before they were willing to come around to it. Yeah, peyote is an interesting one too. Um, And I know that there's a concerted effort to conserve the use of peyote um, because it's so hard to grow. It takes so long. Um, Have you ever experimented with peyote or or mescaline in general? I haven't, no. It's definitely on my list of interest, uh, but no, I haven't used it before. Yeah, nor have I, nor have I. I mean, I guess the San Pedro cactus would be the best way for us to uh, to to get it here in America. Um, but, you know, speaking about sort of the differences of each religion, um, psychedelic use, how do you suggest people create synergy between them? Between their religious belief systems? Yeah, and, I mean, between any religious, yeah, exactly, yep. So um, I'm a strong believer um, in the power of the power of uniqueness, the power of difference. That I think the neoliberal or some of the more pop spirituality way of coming to different religious traditions is to flatten them, to try to make them all say the exact same thing. Um, but the fact of the matter is they don't all say the exact same thing. Um, there is a uh, founder of the, uh, I believe it's the renewal movement in Judaism who experimented with LSD. And he said that there are aspects of, of Judaism and LSD and aspects of LSD and Judaism. But he could not say that the LSD experience was the same as the mystical or daily Jewish experience. So he allowed LSD to be its own thing. It is LSD, and there's elements that, I, that are connected with Judaism. But then there's Judaism, which is its own thing. So instead of trying to force things to come together, we need to be okay with letting, letting things be in its uniqueness. Um, so something I run into with people a lot as well is that they are frequently unaware of how diverse their religious tradition is. Most religions out there, even you know uh, LDS Mormonism at this point, I mean, it's 250 some years old coming up on. So um, there's a broad swath of different ways to interpret one's religion. 
So as a Baptist, it's very frequent that people imagine that Baptists are just one way, that it's Bible-believing, hell or high water, my way or the highway sort of faith. But there are these Baptists all over the world. Um, One example is the No Heller Baptists of Appalachia, who believe that hell doesn't exist, that hell is on earth right now, and we suffer because of our sins, but all people will be saved by God, and all will go to heaven when they die. That is worlds away from the Southern Baptist Church you probably hear down the street from you. Um, In the same way, there are so many different aspects of Christian faith that are less known in the Western world and less known to Protestant Christians here in America. Um, Theosis is one, becoming like, becoming God in a real way, becoming divine, where our ego or our sense of self slowly disappears as we participate in the very energies of God, as we are united with the energies of God. As John the Baptist said in the Bible, he must increase and I must decrease. Um, You can see where the overlaps there with psychedelics might come from. Um, That is the sort of thing that I think we need to do more of. If you can't figure out how psychedelics connect with your faith, don't, don't even either flatten psychedelics to make it fit in your faith or flatten your faith to make it fit in psychedelics. Explore both in their uniqueness and you will probably find many, many more ways to connect the two than you ever found possible before. I love that. That is such a refreshing point of view. It, that's perfect. Um, so what really makes me contemplate the synergy as well of religions and psychedelics are some of the iconography that you see. Hmm. Like, for instance, you know, for me, as I, as I started my journey of psychedelics, I was a massive atheist, massive atheist. And then psychedelics changed that within the first 30 seconds of the first peak experience that I had. Um, But subsequently, I've had experiences where, for one, on a DMT trip, um, I was confronted with Mother Mary figure. And I'm getting goosebumps Ah. just like saying it. It was the most beautiful experience I've ever had, where Mother Mary was right in my field of view. And like, obviously, I'm still, I'm not moving or anything, but my consciousness felt as it was, as, as if it was moving and she was right in the center of my awareness and she was guiding me through this beautiful landscape and just feeding me with all this love and being someone who was not christian i was never raised christian i never went to church as a kid uh, i was lucky you know my my family at least i consider myself lucky my family didn't really impose any sort of ideological or political beliefs on me and my siblings. We were just sort of able to figure it out on our own. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously these, these symbols are deeply embedded into our culture as well, but the fact that I am not a Christian yet, I was confronted with this Christian symbol. Now I have on my altar, I have, you know, the Virgin Mary, I have a little statue of her and I consider her like a, you know, one of my spirit guides now, yeah. yet still not Christian. So. It's strange, you know, you even see this in like religious cultures in Egypt and stuff like that. You see hieroglyphs and all kinds of imagery. So my main question that I contemplate within myself is like, what came first? Did religions extract this and these iconography or these icons out of the psychedelic experience? Or are these experiences influenced by our sort of cultural foundation of religion? Yeah. Um, are you are you familiar with the work of Carl Jung? Have yes. you read into him? Yeah, I, I I I have a copy of Jung's red book, a facsimile of it right next to me right now. Uh, gorgeous. Um, but uh, I do think that there are symbols and ideas and um, innate knowledge, I don't know how else to say it, that is built into our brains as human beings. Um that is pretty universal to us. Um, And psychedelics, psychedelics and religion pool on those symbols. So it's not surprising to me when we would see a Mother Mary symbol in a DMT trip, even if one wasn't religious, Um, even if one had no concept of Christianity, I think we could see that. one of the experiences I had uh, was uh, 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 the dancing Shiva, 
uh, where I took whoever got me these acid tabs, I think had taken a little too much of themselves and sort of double dipped. Uh, you ever had that experience? Um, and I took far more LSD than I thought I was taking. Um, and before me was the dancing Shiva, but I didn't recognize that's what it was, doing the dance of creation and destruction, holding time and existence in its hands. Um, then I read uh, uh, William Richard's book, Sacred Knowledge, on psychedelics, and I read about somebody else who saw the dancing Shiva in their dream or the, in their psychedelic vision. I read of something, somebody else who also saw uh, the same thing, and both of these people had no concept of Hinduism at all. I forgot I had a concept of Hinduism until um, I went to an art museum and saw an artistic depiction that was so similar that I realized I had to have seen it before, and that's what my brain was working with. Um, but something I was just talking about with a friend last night um, was when I take psychedelics or when I dream or when I daydream now, my, my mind and the images that go through my mind are doing this dance. And I can't quite see the dance. I can't quite make out the movement. But there is a, there is a movement of thought and imagery throughout my life now that is the dancing Shiva. I think Jung is probably right that that, it, that dance, that movement uh, is something inbuilt in the human psyche, the idea of dancing, um, and that it appears in different ways, in different religions, different dreams, different visions, different psychedelic trips. So I don't think it's a matter of what came first, the psychedelic trip or the religion. I think they're both drawing on the same fundamental part of the human psyche that knows of difference, change, creation, destruction, movement, whether we like it or not. So is this like the collective unconscious that Jung speaks of? Yeah, something like that. Um, not sure if I buy his more, um, his more overt version of it, where it's an actual thing like God uh, that connects all of, all of the, all of conscious universe. Uh, but I definitely do buy the idea that there are some symbols and some ideas that are inherently indwelt in the human psyche uh, that pop up in different ways. Absolutely. So that leads me to a question also as well that I probably could have asked you right in the beginning. Um, but in your view, what is God? God is ultimately ineffable. So I can't tell you. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that's, that's it. Human language would be, if you can describe God with language, you're not describing God. Um, and so I, I think the only way that we can describe God is through image and symbol. So I, like I said, leaning into our differences um, so that we can learn from each other. I very much understand God as defined in the Nicene Creed and the Christian tradition. God is Jesus incarnate. God is the three people of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, that is the way that I come to experience and interpret God uh, most strongly. Um, but I also recognize and need to have the humility to know other people might see this differently. And I might be wrong. This is simply how I have had God revealed to me, and I can't deny it anymore that I didn't ask a Jew to deny that they're a Jew and that that's how they understand God. Um, the way I've described it to people um, is that, um, you know, we've all heard that all paths lead to God. And this very well might be true, but we have to choose a path. You can't wander through, if you're trying to reach the summit, you can't wander through the woods, popping on one path and off another path and this way and that way. Whatever way has been revealed to us as a tradition that this is how God is being shown to us, we have to commit to it, work with it, sit with it, um, so that those symbols and images are most fully revealed in their fullness of God to us. Yeah, this brings to mind, and I'm going to apologize to my listeners because I bring this up constantly. I've, t I've said this a million times. Uh, this concept that Ramdas has uh, described, where spirituality is like this massive mountain 
and each person starts at a different position of, around the big base of the mountain. And we're all going up to the summit. We're all taking our own different path. Like you said, we're finding our path. We're going up and we're reaching the same summit. And when you get to the top, you find that you're intermingling with Jews, Christians, you know, psychedelic people, Buddhists, you know, because the, the path that you took doesn't necessarily matter. And at the top, when you get there, you actually can't really tell who took which path. And mm -hmm. I really love that because it does really just bring home the point that like, we're all pointing to the same thing. That's this ineffable thing that we're trying to, to bring down into a duality because ultimately when you try to describe the, the absolute, you're, you're breaking it down into like the nature of the duel, because that's how you describe things with human language. And that's how, you know, we interpret information that comes in. So when we want to define something and sort of place it into a box, we're taking the unity of all things and we're placing it down into like a duality, which I mean, you just really can't describe anything accurately doing that. It's just the only way we can sort of make sense of it here. Yeah. And, and yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that uh, is frequently, it, but one of the things that's frequently missed in that, I think, is the, the need for, the need for, um, true belief in something that we can at least grab onto. Um, uh, uh, when we talk about these different symbols, I think a lot of people like to try to jump right to the summit, that we're just going to bop right on up there and everything's fine. But for, for many, many mystics, they didn't reach this sort of summit by, by shedding their religious differences. They reached the summit by dedicating themselves to it. So the Sufi Muslims, as they became more Muslim, they got closer to that ineffable truth. As the Christian mystics became more Christian, they got closer to that ineffable truth. Shamans, Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever you want to say with that. That it wasn't, uh, uh, I think people, I love that image that Ram Das uses, but I think some people have this idea of, all right, we made it, we can take off our cloaks and here we are at God. So, hey, everybody, glad we made it. But the mystics consistently give this image of, of God loves, God loves uniqueness. God loves difference. God loves all of this different diversity. And that by leaning into your particular form of diversity, you are able to more closely reach that top of the summit. Love that. <clears throat> and that's where the spiritual practice comes into play. Whatever your spiritual practice is, it needs to be, or it should be at least consistent, and you should dedicate yourself to it, and you will find your path. And people's paths often converge, they change, but it's the way that you find your path is through spiritual practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thought about converting to Buddhism uh, half, halfway through my time in seminary, which was a rough time to be thinking about that. Um, but instead of Buddhism, I came across uh, hesychastic um, um, uh, meditation, which is an Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition. And what I found was a lot of similarities between mantra meditation, mindfulness meditation, disconnection from desire, compassion for all living things. There were all of these grand similarities with Buddhism within my own tradition, my own Christian tradition. Um, so yeah, I, I a hundred percent agree with you that it needs to start with practice, but before you decide, I think it's also good that before you know what practice you're going to commit to, or you like that practice, so should you convert from the faith that you feel so strongly attached to, got to explore your own faith that more likely than not, there's millions of people that believe it, maybe even billions over history. And a diversity, a beautiful carnival and circus of different options to be able to approach God with symbols with which you're familiar and practices that get you there closer. Definitely, definitely. Let's talk a little bit about death. Okay. What does what do your studies and also your psychedelic experiences teach you, um, or what light does it shed on death? That's a great question. 
um, there's a stu- there is one study that I saw that compared psychedelic experiences to near death experiences, and there were some great overlaps, but there were also some significant differences. Um, so I can say pretty strongly that uh, um, psychedelic experience and what it gives us, even at those high dose levels, um, is not the same experience that comes at death. The only way that we can experience death is to experience death. And if we're trying to tell ourselves that we're ready for death because we've taken psychedelics, then we're actually giving ourselves a crutch to avoid the reality of what death is. Um, but I, I, some of those aspects that are similar to death um, um, are nonetheless useful for us to begin meditating on it. Um, when I first took DMT, uh, I was terrified. Uh, I had always had those hours for a come up with a drug, right? You have a lot of time to get ready for what's coming. And this was just there seconds later that I was going to die. Um, And I just had to let go because I realized I have no control over this thing. No control. I am going to have a DMT trip whether I like it or not now. And I'm going to die whether I like it or not. So you can either resist the irresistible and have a terrible time. Or you can just let it happen and appreciate the experience for what it is. Um, so that, that experience taught me a lot about death and, and how to approach it. Um, I take a rather agnostic view of what happens when you die. Um, I do believe that the consciousness exists beyond death. Um, but I don't have any idea what that looks like. And that's part of, I mean, that's part of what the psychedelic experience teaches as well, that your concept of what consciousness means looks really different on five grams of magic mushrooms than it does on a Tuesday afternoon when you look out your window at work and wonder, God, is this all there is? Do we just work and die? Um, so yeah, I, I, I do like the Christian idea of theosis, and that's what I lean into when I think about death. Um, that when you die, and this is something that can happen throughout your life as well, the goal of the Christian faith is for oneself to begin to disappear and to be filled with the energies of God. This is something that can happen right now through spiritual practice, through uh, participation in mass or the holy mystery in the Orthodox Church or going to whatever tradition you're a part of. Um, it could happen in your daily meditation and prayer, through time spent in nature, through time with your family, the slow dissolution of your desires to be filled with the humility, the love, the joy of God. When you die, that is not the beginning of that journey into theosis, becoming one with God. It is just a big step. And if you spend your whole life starting to lean into that process of theosis of leaning into God's energies. It's not going to be nearly as scary when the time comes and you're just taking a really big step into something you've practiced for all your life. Very, very beautifully said. And I do think that psychedelics are a very good tool to practice that transition of death and to yeah. practice uh, like curbing the anxiety of death, you know, as you see in a lot of these research um, clinics where I think it was Johns Hopkins University did one where they were giving psilocybin to end of life patients who had Mm -hmm. stage four cancer and things like that. And a lot of them were uh, becoming a lot more uh, open to the transition of death. And I think one of them actually said that, which was really cool. He said, uh, I learned more about what it means to live. So as a result, my fear of death has been greatly diminished. And you see these cultures, um, like if you read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, they describe the bardos. Um, and these are obviously just hypotheses, you know, theories of, you know, what it means to transition, what kinds of things you're going to be going through during transition. But I do think psychedelics are a great way to practice because of that, that ego disillusion, you know, yeah. because one thing that you are going to lose when you die, at least in my opinion, is probably your sense of, Josh, Caleb, 
my preferences, who I think I am, my family, all these things that you define yourself as, pretty safe to say that stuff is probably going to be shed and whatever exists beyond that. I'm kind of with you there. I do think that consciousness does move on or it goes somewhere or does something. But even saying like, I think your consciousness moves on or goes somewhere, it feels dirty because again, I'm yeah. bringing this powerful absolute concept down into a dualistic way. And it's just, it doesn't describe it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and one of the, one of the things that's powerful for me with, uh, we talked about before with the Eucharist in this idea is, um, you know, when you eat the, when you eat the bread and the wine, um, this is Jesus crucified that you are eating in a very real way. Jesus is right here. Um, and I've meditated on that with the concept of death and sort of consciousness or substance before. Um, and it's a very powerful idea that when you sit there and look at this bread and this wine, and this isn't just supposed to be the man, Jesus Christ, this is supposed to be God of the universe. And if you are, as I am a panentheist, that all in God, this is the universe in a wafer and a little sip of wine. You really think about that, the unification that creates. And that there, this is a person, this is a person and God, this is a person and God and the universe here in my hands. That meditation has been incredibly powerful for the opposite with me. This is my body and this is Caleb Graves. And I'm also dissolving into the being of God. And when I take this wafer and this juice, I somehow take in God as well. The boundaries between oneself and God and those around us begin to fade away substantially in that moment. And I think that a lot of the Christian practices, that's also a way of preparing for death and that sort of transitionary period too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So how do you think of heaven and hell within this? So um, one of the misunderstandings with Christianity, I think, is that the goal is that you either go to heaven or you go to hell. And that's, those are your options. But it's what we see in the Christian scriptures and most of Christian history is the belief that in the resurrection of the dead, that eventually everyone will be resurrected into this spirit body, this alternative means of existence. It's not totally clear. You're going to be genderless, according to Paul. Uh, you're not going to want the same things. You won't need to eat or drink, but you can eat and drink. Um, it's describing this very, very different mode of existence. Um, what, like we said before, the dissolution of what it meant to be us, is, is it's over. It's something totally new has begun. And that is the goal of the Christian faith, is participation in that resurrection. Um, Again, leaning into our differences, these are the symbols I use to understand what happens when one dies. Um, so I do believe in hell, which might be shocking for people, but I don't think it's permanent. Um, we see in the Psalms this idea where King David is crying out um, and he's being oppressed. He's being defeated, tortured, uh, family is being massacred, etc. Just his enemies are overtaking him. And as he asks for salvation, for help, for, for, for uh, liberation from his oppressors, you see that he's asking for pain to be caused to his oppressors. If you are the one who is standing on another man's neck and you have to be tackled to get off his neck, it's going to hurt. Liberation uh, frequently, liberation for the oppressed frequently looks quite painful for the oppressor. Um, so I, I also think about this in very uh, psychedelic terms, frankly, where if theosis, if God's wrath and love are one and the same, it is the burning away that all it, that has come before so that we can experience God directly, the energies of God directly. If we have committed heinous things throughout our lives, 
you know, or or even not that heinous things, but we've participated in a structure, an institutional system, a society that crushes the weakest and poorest among us. And we did that knowingly and did very little to help. We might experience quite a bit of suffering being before a God who is pure love and justice. But I think the difference comes in with repentance. The same way with psychedelics, when we have that overwhelming anxiety, fear, terror, pain during a difficult trip where there is something we're not willing to face, that I think is a decent conception of such a hell. But when you have repentance, when you say, yes, I did not love my neighbor as myself. Yes, I did not give to the poor and needy as I should have. Yes, I willfully took advantage of the most vulnerable among us and you face that, it's not gonna hurt any less, but now you are welcoming that like, like a necessary surgery or the setting of a bone. It is painful, it is horrible, but you know it's necessary to continue your journey. But if you're someone who's having a psychedelic trip, right, and you refuse to look at these things, you refuse to look at this, you're just gonna keep suffering. The trip might end and you're just riddled with anxiety and fear. Same way that I see heaven and hell in a lot of ways. We are going to face the exact same energies of God. And it's either going to feel like great joy and love, great wrath and suffering, or as many times happens in psychedelics, both at the same time. And we can choose repentance to say, I'm sorry, show me love, show me justice and lean into that, that's heaven. Or it is the refusal to look at that, the refusal to repent, the refusal to acknowledge you've done wrong, and the continuation of suffering. Amazing. It reminds me of the hero's journey a bit, you know, uh, the refusal of the call being, you know, the, uh, the, the roadway to hell and mm. uh, possible... Uh, unforeseen consequences to not only you, but your entire community from refusing the call. That's a good uh, idea. And, I haven't thought of that before. Yeah. And Caleb, as we're approaching an hour here, we're a bit above and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, as we wrap up here, can you just share uh, where people can find you? And let's talk a little bit about uh, psychedelic theology or psychedelic education ministry. Sure. So I'm on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, uh, I've got a Patreon that's coming up pretty soon um, on and a website of psychedelic theology. Um, so if you just search that on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, YouTube, that should come up um, or go to psychedelictheology.com. Um, this is what I'm hoping to do full time at some point in the future, uh, slowly building it up over time, um, is creating spaces where one, People who have Christian experiences like yourself but aren't Christians have a safe Christian to talk to about such experiences where I'm not trying to convert you. Um, but also simultaneously, people who are a Christian who takes psychedelic substances therapeutically or recreationally and need to figure out how to integrate this into their spiritual lives, the symbols they already hold dear, um, will also have a place to understand that. So a lot of this work is going to be wonderful conversations like this, where I recognize I'm one of the only Baptists in the world who is interested in both topics at the same time, uh, but also consulting for churches, making articles. I've got a couple of informational, uh, really nice YouTube videos I'm making coming up. So it's going to be uh, everything all at once, really. <laughs> Yeah, this is something that I really think the world needs, and I'm so happy to uh, to promote it. And I'm so happy that we got to have this conversation today, Caleb. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Definitely. Thank you very much.